Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Chuck Jones Creative Side Chat. My name is Ben Olson. I sit on the board of the Chuck Jones Center for Creativity in California, and I also run the Chuck Jones Center Chicagoland in Schaumburg, Illinois. And uh, while usually I play the Robin to Craig's Batman, tonight I am going to play the Robin to Jerry Eisenberg's Batman. And we have a legend in the animation and TV film world that I just get a kick out of the more I read about him. And we are ecstatic to bring you this man tonight who was able to work with Chuck in his unit, who has some fantastic stories, a fantastic history and lineage, uh, family history in, in the arts, and it's wonderful. And so if you can all virtually put your hands together as we introduce Mr. Jerry Eisenberg. Hello, sir, good evening. Good evening, everybody. You are hey, live. Me. <laughs> Love the shirt. Love the shirt. How come I don't have a Chuck Jones t-shirt like you, Ben? Um, I'm going to send you a Chuck Oh, and my makeup lady is here. Did <laughs> you bring two hairbrushes? Yeah, uh, and with my gigantic forehead, I could use some toning down myself because I'm a little yeah, shaggy right enough now. There for the <laughs> <laughs> you have way more hair than I do, and I'm completely <laughs> jealous. So, Jerry, we are absolutely thrilled to have you um, for a number of reasons. And part of what thrills me is I never did have the opportunity to meet Chuck because by the time I had met Craig, it was in 2008. Oh, and Chuck had already passed away in 2002. And so I feed off the memories and the, the stories of people who are influenced by Chuck. And, um, and you've got that. And not only did you meet Chuck, you got to work with him on numerous projects, which yes. I think is fantastic. And um, I'm thrilled tonight to, to be able to interview you, sir, and hear your stories. And what I wanted to start with is um, to take it all the way back to the beginning, right, uh -huh. as we get into your, to your history. And what I wanted for people who are watching tonight to know also is there is a site. We have Chuck Jones Catalog, and it is uh, chuckjonescatalog.com forward slash Jerry hyphen Eisenberg which has a complete catalog of Jerry's, some of Jerry's original art. We've got stuff from MGM. We've got, we got all kinds of good stuff. The Gillette commercial, which I'm gonna bring up later. There's some sketches in there of him in the Roman costume. I love that one. So um, as you guys, as we're doing the interview here, you can take a look at some of the pieces that are um, available on chuckjonescatalog.com forward slash Jerry hyphen Eisenberg. And uh, Jerry, I wanted to get into um, your father and, and what he started. And, and I want to start at the, when you were born uh, yes. in 1937, he started at Terry Tunes. And, and what I find fascinating about that is his intro into that in 1937, when you we were born, he worked with a, with a young man named Joe Barbera, who, who knew how many years later you would end up working with. Right. So as, as, Har as Harvey, um, was kind of instrumental in, in that era of things. And, and he was doing a lot of stuff. He loved layout and design. Um, you got into that, had to have some kind of influence on you as a, as a child. And then you get into your high school years and you're doing uh, the sports cartoon for the LA Examiner. I was, I'm wondering what kind of, growing up in that atmosphere, did that, what kind of influence, even maybe subconsciously, did that have on you? And I know you were into sports and basketball, but you were into layout and design and ad design. What kind of influence did that have on you? Oh, my father had a, I used to watch him work. He had a room behind the garage that was his studio room. Years later, he rented an office in Culver City, but uh, he used to do a lot of work out there. I'd go in and watch him work, and he'd show me things. And uh, 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 as far as influence, I he did influence me. So what was it about layout and design um, that you found? Because uh, in reading through a lot of interviews, I found that fascinating. Yeah, well, that came when I, uh, when I was graduating high school and I was graduating that Scholastic, Scholastic Sports Association group at the LA Examiner. They gave me a three-year scholarship to the Chouinard Art Institute. So going there, uh, I took design classes and... Uh, I think I took an advertising, a lot of life drawing. And even when I left to start my career, I went to Art Center uh, Art School at night studying uh, advertising design. I just, I've always been interested in advertising design, industrial design, besides cartooning. 
which uh, and I love because I'm in the same kind of realm as that. So when I when I was reading that about your um, kind of history and what you enjoyed, what I what I find is our careers kind of take paths of their own. And as that was kind of a heavy interest, your father kind of had a key role as he was working with Joe Barbera, um, you know, and they were kind of starting things off in their in their unit there of at what are you about 19 or 20 when he suggested you go to MGM. Yeah, well, I was leaving art school with Chenard, and I needed a job. So my father arranged an appointment for me with Joe Barbera at MGM at their cartoon studio. So I went with my portfolio, and I got hired as an apprentice in-betweener. And that's how it all started. So what was that like walking into? Now, obviously, today we have we have the hindsight, right? Of, and we know what, what legendary films came out of that and, and everything that you guys worked on. What was that like walking in and meeting Joe Barbera for an interview? Uh, well, it, it was kind of uh, exciting. I, 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 my memory is a bit fuzzy. You know, that's pretty far back now. 1956, I think it was. Um, but uh, I had already met Joe maybe a few times because he and my father became friends in New York. And then Joe came out first, and then he got my father to come out. When I was born in New York, like in December 37, my father was already out here at MGM working with Joe. And then he had my mother bring me out when I was 18 months old. <laughs> not, not a bad way to start off uh, your introduction into some, some, the animation world and being taken at a year and a half into a, what would be a legendary studio. So and what I wanted to bring up, too, was your father worked on um, the Yogi, he worked on Yogi Bear, he worked a lot with that, but specifically even the cartoon, the comic series. Right. Well, in the comics, when he left MGM somewhere in the mid 40s, he wanted to work on comic books most of the time. I think, uh, I think he said, or I heard he could make more money. He was very fast, very good. He did tons of uh, Tom and Jerry comic books, Droopy. And of course, later on, he did a lot of Hanna-Barbera books. He did a some of the Disney comic books. Um, I remember something, Mickey and the Submarine Pirates, and it was <laughs> one with Donald Duck and Mickey. It was something like a J Jack and a, the Giant Beanstalk or something. And what's what? And if, if for people that are watching right now, what we're even there are some um, items available. It's, it's some of your father's originals. Right, some of the layout drawings from the Yogi Bar uh, Yogi Bear cartoon series, which are the well, comic series. Yeah, Go that ahead. was a daily uh, comic strip he did for the newspapers. And what I what I love about that is I love I like the the sketches and the drawings, the original stuff before it goes in. And we've got a full panel comic along with some others of Yogi, which if you're uh -huh. going to ChuckJonesCatalog.com forward slash Jerry hyphen Eisenberg, you can see those originals. Fantastic stuff. Um, so 20 years, you know, you're born in 37, 57, start up with, uh, or, well, actually, let's get to where, when you go to MGM, you're working there. How long, talk about, talk about a, a, a quick uh, reality check. How long does that last your first stint at MGM? Oh, gee, it was short. It was only seven months. And then the studio, uh, MGM decided to close the cartoon division. So years later, when, uh, uh, Warner, what was it? Warner Brothers bought Ted Turner, who ha happened to own Hanna Barbera at the time. They moved over with us in Sherman Oaks, and they used to have an annual birthday party thing for luncheon for Joe Barbera. And one time, when I'm up on the dais with some other people, I was I was thanking Joe for giving me my first job in the in the business. But I said, and then you closed the studio seven months later. I said, you'll do anything to get rid of me. Because <laughs> I used to elicit uh, really great zingers from him, and uh, I can't remember what he zinged me with on that one, but uh, <laughs> I've written a lot of them down. That's so awesome. I didn't have them with me, but so you go and you you start working at Hanna Barbera Studios uh, with Joe, and seven well, months later it closes down. No, or that MGM. Was the MGM Cartoon Studio, right? The MGM Cartoon Studio with Joe, and then and then that closes down. And you go for about, what, it was about four months? Yeah, three or four months I was unemployed. And then I got hired at the Warner Brothers Cartoon Studio in Burbank. It was on, on the southeast corner of the main lot. And uh, I continued as an in-betweener. 
And then uh, uh, I did work for all three units. There was Frizz Freeling's unit, Chuck's, and Bob McKimson. But I really loved what, what Chuck was doing with Mike Maltese, Maurice Noble, great animators. And uh, uh, my friend Willie Ito was assisting Ken Harris in those days. That's where I met Willie. And, uh, but he left uh, maybe a year and a half or so after that to uh, work with, um, I think it was Bob Clampett on the Beanie and Cecil TV stuff. And so Ken Harris asked for me to be his assistant. And boy, that, that's just where I wanted to be in Chuck's unit. So uh, let's... Chuck was, uh, what a talent. I mean, he, he was like a teacher, a mentor, uh, very intellectual. Uh, I don't know, he was just terrific to listen to. You know, I, w I wish I had spent even more time with him, but he would take the time. I could stop by his office and he'd say, yeah, come in and I have a few questions. And he, he'd show me, he'd, he'd show me the answers. And he taught me a lot of things. So do you have something, uh, first of all, you're, you're working with, um, you're, you're working under Ken Harris, which yes. who's a legendary animator and his oh. action, the way he's able to animate that is dance. Was there something, and I'll, I'll piggyback this to Chuck in a moment. Was there something in working with Ken Harris as you got to just absorb that and work as his assistant that just a learning experience right off the where you're like, man, you know, and it, and it was an instant thing like I can, you know, and he, what was it that he taught you that really sunk in? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, a lot of things are intrinsic, but uh, it was just, he was a terrific person. You know, he, he must have been in his 50s in those days, but it's funny. He just see, he, he seemed so much younger. You know, he um, just had this wonderful spirit about him besides all his great talent. Uh, he would leave a scene for me to animate once in a while, which I really appreciated. And uh, one time, some of the guys had stopped by and were chatting like at break time. And uh, he, I remember him saying, he said, Jerry thinks we're the same age. He talks to me like I'm in college with him or something. <laughs> Ken brought that out in me. He just, he didn't seem like an older guy. Like he said, I was probably about 20 or 21. And, uh, which is which is amazing. And so you I get, if I you, can remember ahead. more details. I mean, no, you know, and I, what I love it, you, you know, we're left with those impressions that people give us. And I think that's a wonderful impression. He and, also liked to listen to Chuck Cecil's radio show. They play all the big band music and I love that stuff too. So we had a lot in common that way. And uh, sometimes I'd send a cartoon into Chuck Cecil from the both of us. And then we get all excited. We'd hear Chuck talk about us on the radio. <laughs> Maybe a few <laughs> days later. And which I, I ran out the nice. hall and I asked everybody, turn on the radio to whatever the station was. They're talking about Ken and me. And Corny <laughs> Cole, who was next door, he was uh, the assistant to, uh, oh shoot, I'm forgetting the name right now. He made a funny cartoon of that whole incident. Well, you know, to, so to piggyback off that, which, which I love, so animation, you know, uh, for w when I studying and growing up and, and really wanting to get into that, I would always read stories and you always see animators that where you're, you're constantly caricaturing yourselves, situations, yeah. your friends. And, and Abe, so Corny Cole, Abe Levito. Um, Abe Levito. And, and what I was, and so to piggyback off this caricature thing, that dynamic between the three of you, um, what was that like? Because I, what, I've, what I've read, and I've heard one story from you at the Chuck Jones um, family gathering last year, was that, you know, the interesting things that you would do about caricaturing each other. Right, yeah, I really wasn't doing it, any caricatures in those days, but Abe Levito, I've got several things he did of me, and then some of me and Corny, he, put, he would put Corny and me together. I was always teasing Corny about his surfing. You know, like I'd say, Corny, when, when are you gonna take me to Surf City or something like that? And Abe used to do these funny, funny caricature gag cartoons. And then Corny was doing some. Um, I can't remember who else. It was mainly Abe and Corny. So that was kind of like the uh, the Three Musketeers, if you will. Yeah, but I didn't do any gag cartoons then. Years later, I was doing that stuff. But, uh, so did you find that you guys fed off each other in that that sense of humor that you know, that brevity that kind of works around. Did you find, did you find a good sense of that in the, in the unit between Chuck and, 
you know, Frizz and all that when you guys worked together? Was there a good collaboration? Yeah, you mean between the units possibly? Well, like, so you, you mentioned Corny was an assistant for, you know, another animator on another team. Um, Dick you know, Thompson was his animator. Just kidding. Okay. And so did you guys find that good, like where you're, you kind of have that good collaboration, that it, things just gelled? Right. There was a wonderful camaraderie. I mean, like the coffee breaks every, every uh, morning. I don't remember if we did it in the afternoon. They were the best, the funniest coffee breaks I've ever attended over the years. Better than at any other studio. Amazing, because Mike Maltese and this other cartoon writer from Bob McKimson's unit, Ted Pierce, they were so entertaining. And then Frizz's animator, Jerry Shinicky, he was so funny too. I mean, and the gals that would come in there, it was, it was the best. I wish we would have had video cameras in those days, you know, and to pick up the sound also. Now, I can't remember a lot of the funny stuff that was said, but it was, I remember Willie used to get hysterical once in a while. Well, and, and, I, and, and I'll let Willie, because uh, I've heard some funny stories from both of you guys, and certainly Willie's got a, uh, a couple of funny stories, too, from his time with Chuck. Probably. Um, and, you know, what I wanted to show, too, was if we could, Scott, if we could pull up um, as we're going. I did want to show the, the Yogi Bear, um, if we have those at some point. Scott, go ahead, and you can pull that up as we get into. So your time at, um, your time at Warner Brothers, the influence uh -huh. that you got from Chuck, like here's some sketches. Jerry, can you see those on screen? Yeah. I love this one, by the way. This is the Sonny Bono and Monsters one. This we is were brilliant. developing something with Sonny Bono, but it never developed into anything. I don't know. I don't know what inspired me to do this thing. Uh, this is one of my favorite. Idea. I, I, when I went through the catalog and was looking at all the work that you did, I immediately attached myself to this piece. Oh, huh, thank you. I love the design. I, I could remember more. Oh, that's. That was at Ruby Spears when we did the, what was he called? He was the world's ugliest dog. He was so ugly, he wore a doghouse because if, <laughs> if, you, if you saw his face, uh, I can't, I remember I was trying to think of what could this guy have? I even put a, uh, what is the thing that the dogs tinkle on, the uh, fire hydrant? Yes. And I, but then there was this really nice fellow uh, Willie was working at Disney at that time when we were developing these Ruby Spears shows. And he brought him over one evening, Carson Van Austin. And Carson, I think it was him that came up with the doghouse idea. I loved it. That's hilarious. He would help me once in a while with some development stuff. Now, this, so, I don't remember. Oh, there's the Heathcliff. I love Heathcliff. Heathcliff. All of these are available for purchase on Jerry or chuckjonescatalog.com oh, forward slash. This was an original that, oh. Wait, can you go back, Put Scott? Put it back, Ben. <laughs> Come on, Ben. There we go. Oh, nope. Not that. Hold on, Scott. If we can, there we go. Nope. Who's, who's doing this? Anyway, that's uh, Yoink of the Yukon. Uh, my friend Don Jerwich and, and another fellow, a writer, Jim Ryan, and me, the three of us created this short for that shorts program they were doing at Hanna-Barbera. I think it was, was it called What a Cartoon or something? That, that was put together by Fred Siebert, who was the president of the studio at that time. Which, and and, and what I, I, love the, I love the animation drawings and then you have the final cell of the entire piece. Yeah, I've got a lot more of these, but I'm not telling Scott about it. <laughs> I gotta keep some things. We'll I keep that just between. A few more. Absolutely. We'll keep that between you, us, and Facebook. Um, so your your career, is, is, as we cycle through some images here, um, I know that there's 98 credits in IMDb. And I know that's just pales in comparison to how many actually credits that you have on films. Yeah, and I've been, I've been absolutely fascinated by the work that you've done. And what I wanted to, as we take a look at some Tom and Jerry pieces and some character design. Uh-huh. So when when you you know I, I know you had mentioned um, oh, earlier that's about the Maurice Noble layout by the way oh okay. that's from What's Opera and Doc I'm pretty sure that's from What's Opera Doc it's a very light uh, the pencil is very light but, oh Maurice what a terrific layout man he was did you get to how how well did you get to know Maurice well I got to know him uh, I was just there I'm thinking two two and a half years before I left to go with Hanna Barbera. Uh, 
I didn't, didn't really know him that well. I got I got to know Mike Maltese more, and maybe even Chuck. But. So did that when when you were when you were in the Warner Brothers unit? Was there a film that you had that you just as and you know Chuck always said he doesn't have his favorites, right? They're all like children to him. Was there was there a film though for you or a character that you worked on in a scene that was really something that you really like? Man, this was it. This is my favorite. Hmm. I don't know if I had one favorite, but I really I'll loved the three character favorites. Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> I, loved, I loved the way he was always after the black and white cat. He thought she was a skunk. Um, of course, I think uh, Mike uh, co-created the uh, Roadrunner show with Chuck. That was always a lot of fun. Uh, oh, Marvin any? the Martian. I love that voice. Yes. So Marvin is one of my favorites. Did you, you have the voice, Ben? Um, mm, it's the Illudium Q36. It's about Very as good. close as I can get. Oh, the kaboom! <laughs> there, you do it better than I do. Uh, what, what, when you were working in betweens with Ken, um, was there something in a film like if it was it a Marvin the Martian cartoon or something that you just something that stuck out in, in a? And I know you said not maybe one favorite, but even something on a scene that you worked on. Gee, I, I'm sorry, I can't recall really. That's okay. And like, like my favorite, What's Opera Doc, amongst a few others, that was done probably just before I came on board. You know, came to, I came to the studio in August of '57. Which, when in so in your your tenure there at Warner Brothers, everything you got to soak up with Chuck and Mike, and uh, and Ken. You take that into what I found interesting was you, your passion was still, even though you're doing um, assistant in, in animation, your passion was still layout and design, correct? Yeah, I was always interested in that. And uh, I don't know, but I did like the full animation. I think when I started at Hanna-Barbera doing layouts, um, what was it? When I'd lay out a scene, I'd usually put in extra drawing, extra poses. I was kind of like semi-animating it. <laughs> I missed the full animation. So you, you were kind of doing that. I was fast the... enough. I could I could add extra stuff and still make the schedule. You know, get the stuff done when it was due. So you you were kind of doing an animatic before we knew what an animatic was. Really? Maybe. Yeah. So uh, I that and I I wanted to get into this period with you and and Hanna Barbera. Um, I believe what was it 1961 about. I Somewhere started there. there actually, it was also August. It was like an even four years. August 57, went to Hanna-Barbera, August 61. But before that, Bill Hanna used to call, would call me at Warner Brothers and say, would you and Ken be interested in doing, uh, animating some commercials for us? So I said, well, let me ask Ken. So I talked to Ken about it and he said, sure. So I used to pick up and deliver stuff at the uh, Hanna-Barbera studio. That that went on for about a year and a half or two before I came on board, you know, on the staff. So what 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 commercial, do you remember, do you remember? Uh, well, they used to do a lot of Kellogg's, uh, for Kellogg's and Post cereals. Mm, it was, was probably it Yogi, Bear? Yogi, Yogi Bear, Huck yes. Hound. I, I can't remember too much detail right now. So I, and what's funny was when I was doing the research on this, I did find a Yogi Bear at Kellogg's commercial and it was around the same era of when I believe you were probably picking some of that up and it I, I find it fascinating and so as you get into so you've known Joe right and then Bill is is calling you while you're at Warner Brothers and then you finally make the jump what was it that really um you know was it the layout and the design aspect of things and getting more of that what made the decision to move to Hanna-Barbera okay well it started back in, I think, around 1958 or into 59. Joe offered me a job in the layout department. And I was talking to my father about it. I mean, I was interested, but he said, I took my father's advice. He said, why don't you stay at Warner's longer and learn more about the animation? I'm glad I took his advice because that's always a good uh, foundation, you know, animation. Absolutely. It helps you with layout when you're laying out the characters and the poses. So that's what happened. I could have gone to Hanna Barbera full time, uh, maybe a couple of years earlier, but I stayed on. That well, and 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 I'm glad you did because you know what came out of that. What what going back to kind of bring in how your you know the work that your father did and how the, at, you ended up working on the projects that 
were you know involved with your father so um the flintstones come to right they're, they're looking for this your father had this idea of a that i think he did layout drawings if i if i'm correct of kind of this caveman caveman cave age family well and then no, and then it really wasn't thought. really flying i mentioned uh, to scott the other day you know there's that website yowp y-o-w-p yes. Jim benny from vancouver canada we had a long phone interview and, and I've got that story in there and it's also in a few other places. It's in that Flintstone book that uh, Turner published. But what happened was when my father was working with Western Publishing, one of the editors, Chuck McKimson, asked my father if he'd want to uh, go into business with him, be a partner with him and a, and a financier who was going to, uh, you know, set up the office space and everything and financed everything. So my, my father was telling me this. So my father started creating some ideas for television shows. And one was a caveman family. I remember seeing the artwork, but it was just one family. There was a father, a mother. I think there was a teenage daughter, a young son, and a, they had a pet uh, dinosaur. Uh, I can't, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name my father had for them but uh, that probably wouldn't have been the final name. But that, anyway, uh, what happened, my father told me on the day that they were to sign the contracts, you know, for this partnership and the development deal, uh, my father, uh, the contract was messengered over to my father. And he said, uh, I didn't see my name in there as a partner. That was the, uh, what we agreed on. So he said, I called Chuck. And Chuck said, I changed my mind. I want to be the boss. You'll, you'll get a big, uh, in those days, this was like 19, oh, maybe 55, 56, somewhere in there, maybe 57. You'll get something like $450 a week, which was pretty good money in those days. Uh, I remember when I started at MGM, it was $49 a week. So, um, Anyway, my father said, no, thank you. And Chuck came over and couldn't talk my father into that. My father said, we had an agreement. So my father said, I just tore up the contract and threw it in the wastebasket. Chuck went off and he went into business by himself with this money man. And within a year, he was back at the uh, publishing company at Western. But I remember the caveman family. So my father was thinking prehistoric. And I forget what else he showed me, darn it. And I don't know whatever happened to those drawings. I couldn't find them after my father passed away. But uh, the way he, then the next thing I know, I'm working at Warner's. My father would come over sometimes, take me to lunch. He said, I had lunch with Joe last week, Joe Barbera. And I said, I think I gave him a pretty good idea for nothing. And uh, it turns out, uh, my father didn't say a lot. You know, he didn't talk a lot about some things. Uh, and I guess I wasn't asking questions, you know, I, I was still pretty young. I was even looking at girls more than once, you know, <laughs> I had, had a week's so, anyway, but so it's some, several years later when I'm at Marvel studios, Alan Dinehart, who I had met at Hanna-Barbera, this wonderful man who was, a uh, he helped produce some of the early Hanna-Barbera shows. And then he was a dialogue director. He heard me telling this story to some people on the patio at Marble. So he said, come here. He went in my office with me. And he was there the day my father showed up to have lunch with Joe. And they were showing him all this development artwork of the Honeymooners. Joe, that was his favorite TV show. He wanted to do an animated Honeymooners, but none of the three networks were interested. So he says, your father looks at the stuff. And he says, well, why don't you put them in the Stone Age, put some skins on them and give them a pet die and, you know, da, 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 da. And that's what I call the seed concept. <laughs> and then he said, my father came back from lunch with Joe and he went and found some paper and pencil. He made a drawing. He brought it into Alan's office and said, this is what it, it, they could look like. I've never seen that. I would love to see that drawing. Oh. I don't know how close it would be to what, Ed Benedict design for the Flintstones, but uh, that's and he finally he finally got his concept into reality. Well, Joe didn't was that you know Joe does he did this off and on over the years. 
you give him an idea, he doesn't quite like it that much, he's not sure, he'll come in the next day and it'll sound like it was his idea maybe. I don't know why he did that. But anyway, Alan said, I took the drawing over to John Mitchell's office down the hall. John was the head of Screen Gems, who was the uh, parent company of Hanna-Barbera at that time. And he said, John loved it. And he said, excuse me, he took the drawing into Joe's office, closed the door, came out 10 minutes later, came over to Alan and said, this is what we're gonna develop. So then it became the Flintstones. It was the Flagstones. And then I remember I heard my father said they had to change the name because the Flagstone, there was a Flagstone company, they were objecting. But you know, I like the Flintstones better anyway. I like the Flintstones far better. And if, and if Scott's got some drawings up and, and it's part of what's on the Chuck Jones catalog.com forward slash Jerry hyphen Eisenberg. Jerry, these are, these are yeah. yours. Yeah, that was done for a book, a Flintstone book. I think uh, one of our cartoon friends, Bob Singer had his own business going for a while doing children's books. And he was doing this one for, it must've been for Turner who owned Hanna Barbera. Or maybe it was still Hanna Barbera. And, and then he we asked got... me if I'd freelance some stuff. So I remember doing uh, stuff for one of the Flintstone books. And then I think we've got another one in there, don't we, Scott? Where there we go. But I found a couple more, which uh, uh, maybe Scott will want those. Oh, does Scott know about this? But uh, <laughs> he's got to have something for me—a cheeseburger or something. You know, I ain't just giving them away. <laughs> well, I, I I love this, and 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 this is a good um, time to just kind of chime in here a little bit on. You brought up Bob Singer, and um, there is a 50th anniversary Scooby Doo um, that we have, and and you and Willie signed, and I believe with. Oh yeah. Yeah, there aren't very many of these left, I, from what I've been told. This is Bob was there when we were developing that uh, show. I think. Yes. He, uh, he so and, I and storyboard work on that. Uh, yeah, and, go ahead. So you did storyboard work on this film? Well, it was like a presentation storyboard. You know, the we had, the show hadn't been sold yet, but. Uh, so we've got the 50th anniversary Scooby Doo, um, and we've got it's a limited edition, and with that, I believe, with any purchase of an AP, this is the Bob Singer G Clay, and mm -hmm. I. I don't think there's many of these left either. Um, so they'll give you, from what I've been told from Scott, the, the matching number to the AP that you purchased, but it's it's with an AP purchase, you get this Bob Singer or Bob Singer Giclee, which I think uh -huh. is fantastic. And then that, the uh, Scooby-Doo is the, signed by both you and Willie. So I wanted to show that for everybody so they could see some of the work that you've got up there. Now, um, Bob, so what I, in, in the comic side of things, were, were there times, so so back to Joe Barbera, right, and your dad, Harvey, yeah. um, they did they did a lot of moonlighting from what I hear on, on comics. They yes, would do they their own thing. Maybe and, not a lot. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, they, uh, they co-created two comic books. One was called Foxy Fagan, the other was Red Rabbit. I used to watch my father working on those things in his home studio. And uh, uh, well, he said to me, he said, now, don't tell your friends about this. Because <laughs> he said, because Joe Barbera is under contract to MGM. I'm under contract to Western. And, you know, uh, I guess they weren't supposed to be doing that stuff. They, were, they had a company in Chicago, I think it was Deerfield Publishing, that printed the comic books. And of course, they didn't have their names on them. They couldn't put their credits on. So do you know, do you know about how many, like what, how long that went on? And then did that influence, like, as you got to see your father working on that with Joe, did that help, did that influence, you know, even as you got into working with Joe and Bill? Probably subliminally. Uh, yeah. I can't say for sure. But I used to love to watch my father work. I mean, he had such a great flow to his characters, you know, it's just, uh, I can't think of uh, some other words I'd like to, but uh I'm not sure how many they did. They might have done 10 or 12 issues of each. It could be a little more. Um, and I forget why they stopped. Maybe they each got too busy with other stuff, you know? <laughs> it's like when my father was doing the Sunday Yogi Bear uh, comic page for the newspaper, plus the daily Yogi Bear. That was, 
I, you know, I don't, I never asked if that was more than five days a week. Was it seven? Was he had the Sunday page on Sunday? Anyway, he said, uh, they asked him to do the Flintstone Sunday page. And so he told me he did the first five. And then I remember my father saying, you know, I had to give it up. It was just too much work on top of the comic book work, the Yogi Bear newspaper work. Uh, so he had to, I think he said Dick Bickenbach took over the uh, Flintstone Sunday page. Hmm. Interesting. So as you get in with, uh, you know, Hanna-Barbera, the, the, the amount of work, like the, the legend, I grew up watching those on Saturday mornings. Uh -huh. And um, you got to work on some pretty fantastic characters. As I went just through a short list of characters, um, Yogi Bear, Flintstones, Top Cat, Scooby-Doo, um, the list goes on, Tom and Jerry. You've done, you did layout drawings for the Jetsons. And now that was that before as it was going into development or how did that come about your work with the Jetsons? And I believe we have a piece called uh -huh. Good Day, Madam if Scott can find that one. But go ahead, Jerry. What about the Jetsons in, in that early development? Well, one day, Joe got some of us together. There was a, we had like a core group of layout men and he had some writers that at the end of production, which was usually, oh, maybe September, October, we'd go into the development period, like six months for development, six months for production. Anyway, he called us together and said, we've got this idea for a, a family living in the, uh, I don't know whether to call it the space age or in the future. Um, I don't know who came up with the name. There's a lot of things I didn't even ask about, but uh, I loved it. That was my favorite show of all the shows I did layouts on. I like the Flintstones an awful lot, but I love the future because, you know, you, we could really use our imagination when it came to designing props, backgrounds, buildings, whatever, because there were no rules. There's no precedent. You know, who knew what the future would look like in four or 500 years? Although things don't change that much. You know, you can look at, there's buildings in New York that go back 200 years or more, and they're still the same. There's a lot of new ones too, of course, but well, I'm wondering if we can put up while you're while you're talking about that, Scott, because we have some of this development work, uh, like time travel with dog and and some other things. I'd be fascinated to to hear your input as we, Scott, can you put up some of those Jetsons drawings? Okay. See if we can get those up, because what I love about what you said is like, who knows what? Well, well that's Bang Face. And you get into um, Alex Toad. Oh, well, there's the I'm, Gillette stuff. Well, I'm going to get into that because there's a whole bunch of good stuff there. But if we can, if Scott can find the the Jetsons, it's the time travel with dog. It's the um, good day, madam. When you, you had mentioned no rules, right? And so you're, you're coming up with whatever. We'll get back to and Scott will find. We can here. really use our imaginations. I love that. I love designing stuff on the Jetsons. So what, what kind of, you're, you're told to do a car. You can do a flying car. You can do whatever. Uh, I, I love the idea of walking a dog, but the kid's not walking the dog. He's in a little capsule and the dog's in a capsule and he's floating yeah. past the thing. Um, what, what kind of things when you were in development that you just let your mind go? Do you remember anything that kind of stood out as far as it was just, man, this would be the wackiest thing ever if this happened? Mm, you know, I can't remember. Let's see. There, there was Iwo Takamoto was mm -hmm. very involved. Uh, Willie Ito, I think, was on the development myself. The, one of the cartoon writers, Tony Benedict, uh, he brought in a book one day called, this was, see, we were developing this show in 1962. He brought in a book with the title 1975. and had all these photos of modern items, whether they were appliances or furniture. People were uh, showing what things might look like in 13 years. Uh, that was interesting. But I think what influenced me a lot, there was a Brazilian architect. Uh, he was originally from Germany because his name is Oscar Niemeyer. And I had mm -hmm. a catalog of his work, of his architecture. And his stuff was very, very futuristic and modern. And some of that inspired me. You know, I think I used some of that stuff. So I think exceptions of it. Scott's got question. one up right now. If we can put that one up, the time travel. I love this piece. Oh yeah. It, it, this it, was it, probably done by Dan Gordon. Okay. Dan was an old time cartoonist from New York. He, 
he and Joe and my father worked together in New York also. Dan did comic books, plus uh, working in animation. But he was at Hanna-Barbera, and uh, he, had all, he was a real good idea man. He came up with a lot of these type of ideas for the series. And so, Ed, do you, Scott, do you have Good Day, Madam? Because I, I, I think this one's hilarious also. They're, everyone's in their little pod, in their little machine, which how apropos to today. Uh, we'll see if he can, Scott can put that up. So as, as you're working on um, films, and you, know, you, you mentioned you're, you're putting together development for the Jetsons, um, did that, is that something that you just found absolutely fascinating? Is that development of series that haven't even been created yet and the freedom to just think yeah, we were like uh, helping to create this uh, new thing, whether it's uh, create an idea for a character or just designing the characters. So in, in when, it, when it came to the Jetsons, um, was there a character or kind of a scenario that you particularly were oh, fascinated yeah. with? Yeah, I loved, uh, I think it was Tony's idea. Probably it started with Joe. Joe always liked having a dog in most of the shows. Because, you know, if you're thinking about it, it's the number one pet in the world, probably. But Astro, the dog, and Ewo designed Astro. <laughs> I love the, the look of that Astro and the way he talked. I love the scenes where he would be walking along with George Jetson, and he'd have his arm around George's shoulders. <laughs> yes. The damn thing. <laughs> I saved some cells from that. I wish I had saved more stuff. So did you find as you were going through and, and working on those films to, to your point on kind of saving things, um, were there pieces that, did they let you just keep? Did they let you keep production drawings and, you know, cells? I used to save a lot of stuff I did. Uh, well, of course the stuff that, the final drawings that were colored and inked, those, those would be mounted on boards, you know, large cardboard, uh, what do you call those crescent boards? It'd be like 30 by 40 inches. Okay. Of course, that, I, I couldn't keep those. Uh, but I kept a lot of my rough and comprehensive stuff that I did. Which I find amazing because as, as you know, the, the, the more I did and learned about animation, especially in the beginning and, and how things were not, maybe the value wasn't, they didn't think was there. And, that, and now today the value is so high on those things. Uh, yeah, who you know, would have known? I mean, it's a shame that, like at Warner Brothers and even Hanna Barbera, they threw out so much stuff. Which is just yeah, that just breaks my heart because man, they, like I look at that that art form of two D animation, you know, ink and paint and and the roughs is just a fantastic form. Yeah. Um, what when when you got into what was the next phase of Hanna Barbera for you before you took your next step? What was what was the kind of the going memory of Hanna-Barbera before you took your next step in your career? Hmm. Well, there was a time in 1974, uh, there was a, a Japanese fellow that worked with us in layout, uh, Takashi Masunaga. He went back to Japan, this, the Sanrio company, they're the people that do the Hello Kitty toys mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, they wanted to get into animation, and they'd, they'd gone to Disney. Disney wasn't interested, but uh, Takashi had an idea to do uh, a, a thing called Metamorphosis, and uh, uh, which were based on the stories of Ovid. And uh, he got some of us to moonlight, you know, work a few nights a week and sometimes on the weekend, helping to develop this idea, which eventually it was produced. At some point, I went back to Japan with Takashi for six weeks for final development. And uh, when it was time to come back, it, it was time for it to go into production here in Hollywood. So uh, I wanted to stay with the project. I didn't own just Moonlight. So it was an easy choice. I gave Hanna-Barbera my one week notice and I went to work full time on the San Rio project because it offered me some new experiences. I got to do, uh, do animation directing, and some of my animators helped me with the timing, you know, learning some of that stuff. And uh, I loved it. You know, I did a, a sequence uh, called Perseus. And the show came out, and then the company decided to, uh, I don't know, they, they changed it. it. 
now it's called Winds of Change, and they changed a lot of the music. I mean, we had the, the Rolling Stones did a song for the Phaeton sequence. We had Joan Baez do uh, something for the opening. Uh, Takashi wanted to get Elton John and Bob Dylan, but he couldn't get those two guys. <laughs> well, you go go big, right, and see what you can pull in. But uh, the Rolling Stones did a great. I had a cassette of that. It's never been released. It was called something like Crisscross, and uh, and then there was a fire at Marvel. Unfortunately, I had my tape cassette there. Oh, got destroyed. So in 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 the work that you've done, and what what I love about your career is, especially as I take took a look at through what you've done. First of all, I love your stuff on Johnny Bravo. I think that's hilarious. Oh, I love that character. Yeah. Yes, um, I absolutely fascinated by him. And and we we've got some stuff from Johnny Bravo. We do have a Jetsons like character model original signed by you too, if Scott can find that. But what I find interesting and fascinating about your career, and uh, what I have such a great respect for is you're a creative and this whole idea of a creative side chat is kind of just unleashing that creativity and you did it through animation you did it through layout and design you did it through writing you did it through producing you did it through directing you found these avenues that allowed you to create in different forms and that you found exciting yes. and i'm wondering as you made that step into directing um you which you had just mentioned the fascination you, you you've got this history of great directors you know that you've worked with how did that pull into what you, you know, the sense of timing, the, the overall story, how did that influence your directing? Oh, that's a tough one. All I know is I remember thinking uh, before everything, uh, before 2D, uh, wait a minute, full animation ended for a while. Uh, I wanted to be a director like Chuck or Frizz uh, and have my own little unit, you know, and have all these terrific talents and make making theatrical shorts. That was a dream I had, but then it wasn't to be. Well, and, and you know, and, and, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention another fantastic directing talent that you worked with, which I find, and I, I would love to hear about this, Tex Avery. Oh, the only thing I did with Tex, see, he'd already left MGM when I started there. But I was doing some freelance in-betweens for Tex. He had an office in West LA up uh, near that Mormon temple. And I used to go by there and pick up an assignment, go home and in between the stuff, take it back. But uh, I never got to know Tex that well, but I loved his cartoons. Yes. You know, all those uh, cartoons with the wolf and that wonderful girl that Preston Blair designed. <laughs> and yeah, um, Scott, if you can start rolling some images too, because I would love to. I would love to roll through. We've got some great Jetsons pieces, um, Scooby Doo. Um, we've got some Yogi Bear spots. Um, how do you find it? A little, you know. Obviously, we've we, we've done so many different things. Loved your work in the Muppets. Oh, that was a development thing I was doing for the Muppet Babies. Yeah, which I I. Love the Muppet Babies. You did, if I'm correct, you did do some work for uh, um, Mickey Mouse. Um, what was it? Mickey Mouse Clubhouse? I can't remember. I freelanced a couple of little things. Uh, never worked on staff at uh, Disney's. Although I used to love to go to the commissary there. I'd visit Willie and other people. Nice. So we've got some images rolling through here. Love this shot of the plane in this cell. Again, yeah, that all one is not as wacky as some of the planes I designed, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> I can't remember what I was thinking on this one. And how come there's somebody missing from the front seat? Uh, that's this a great question. This was a development thing, and I guess it never sold. I used to love to do these kind of cars. Well, and I love your sense of perspective, too, and just what you created in your concept, specifically vehicles and environments. Oh yeah, this is from the Hong Kong Fui development. There's another drawing of the sergeant. I know I've seen, I don't know where it is right now. I think uh, Scott has this one, I guess. And, and mm -hmm. Yeah, I, all this is- I did can see. several ahead. different versions of what Hong Kong Fui's car could be like. But. So what, in, in there you go. This Here's was like thing. a takeoff that Joe wanted on car 54 with a dog. But he never, he wasn't able to sell that one. Love this piece. 
that looks like Joe's rough sketches down below. I guess that's, uh, who's the dog? Is that Spike? I'm not sure. Oh. We've got, I believe that we have- like a Joe Barbera sketch. So yeah. this is a, yeah, and again, everybody can take a look at this on chuckjonescatalog.com. You can see the link down there, forward slash Jerry Eisenberg. Some fascinating work as we scroll through. Um, and what I did want to show too, this, I love this piece. I'm a Marvel fan. Yeah. Yeah, that and was our studio Christmas card or whatever. So yeah, I, my son's a big Hulk fan and uh, my youngest son. So this one, I got a kick out of that. Um, what there's I want the pandas and meatballs and spaghetti. <laughs> okay. uh, love this layout drawing. So could you ex like, and, and if we can pause on this for a second, um, I'm, I'm a, I love this kind of stuff in development and I love the rough blue pencil. Can you tell us a little bit about this? It's from the, the Johnny Bravo, Johnny Bravo. series. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some other drawings that I like better than this one. Maybe Scott uh, doesn't have, the, there's one a building, it was a nuclear building. I like, oh, who was that? We'll see if we can find that. Cause I, I, never I, had, I didn't get around to blocking this one in. See, Van Partible, who created the show, it says Aaron City there. Uh, Aaron City, you know, I think he must have lived in a place called Aaron City. I think he's from the Philippines. Okay, yeah, I, I, I love this. And just the whole essence of it, this is what got me into and, and fired up about animation is seeing the, the concept sketches of stuff that went in the roughs. But then so, there's some backgrounds I did that I like better than this one. I would love to see the background. Scott doesn't doing. have my better ones. We'll have to get we'll have to get on Scott for that. And what was this? This was another. It almost seems like the honeymooners here, like Jackie Gleason and Art Carney, maybe. I I can't remember the concept idea for this. Darn it. So there is there's a. I want to go through too in the commercial that you worked on with Chuck. I think that's from. It was. If I can bring it up here in a second. Um, yeah, it's, it just says future CAD gag is what I have as the, the title oh. of that one. But there is, if we can go to the commercial that you did for Gillette. Okay. So Scott, if you can bring that, do you, oh, you there we go. You So I got a kick out of when I went researching for this and found out that you worked with Chuck on uh, the Gillette commercials. And there, there's some pieces. And Scott, if you can bring up the drawings, because there's one in particular, the Gillette pair, uh, two, and then there's the um, Sharpie Roman, which I absolutely love because it reminds me a little bit of, it, it kind of has a Marvin the Martian feel to it. Oh, okay. um, so when you were, you know, getting hired to work with Chuck on these things, yeah, Scott, can you put that up there? I love... I love this piece. Oh, thank you. And glad the, I saved those. Yeah, I'm glad you saved those too. I love the lettering. I love the character design. It just, it's, I find it absolutely fascinating. And oh. then if, if Scott wants to roll through a little bit, what was your, your process with Chuck on this? And when you did the Gillette commercial? Um, wow, how, I can't remember. Gosh, I must have had conversations. Chuck must have had certain ideas. I'm pretty sure Ken Harris must have done the animation also. So did they, was this something that you worked freelance with them on? You know, I can't remember for sure. I thought it could have been just part of the, my daytime routine. I can't remember for sure. If it so I, I, I love this one also. Um, just the whole design of it, the little, this is what gives me a little bit of the Marvin, the Martian feel as if I'm going into the Martian maggot and pulling levers and, uh, love that kind of it's it's just a beautiful design and then we've got do you have the time machine one scott sharpie roman so he'll scroll through a couple of these here and then there's one this one all right other than that gillette one with the lettering and whatnot this is probably my tied for first favorite of some of the sketches um i just uh -huh. i love it i love what you did with the character like oh, i wish i could remember more about I put the G for Gillette on the shield. Huh. So if, and I'm telling you right now, if 
a couple of these aren't gone by the time we're done with this they will be gone when i put them in the cart and buy them myself yeah i can't remember what chuck had in mind for so like who is this girl and who are the two guys and <laughs> sticks with the roman numerals mean? i don't know oh there's so much i can't recall so well and what i you've got an incredible history of what you've done and obviously we're blessed to have so many examples of your work and what you've collaborated on um as as we we've got a few minutes left here um and and i just want to thank you so much for your time in this because only uh, a few minutes hey i got lots of stuff to talk about ben well then i've got an hour and 10 minutes and we can just keep going <laughs> So what do you have, do you have thoughts on, and you know, current animation, like current projects, how you kind of continue that idea generation and in, in what you're working on today? Well, today I'm, uh, I call myself semi-retired. I'm closer to retired, but I work on my own ideas, character designs or whatever. And I do cartoons for family and friends. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I was helping a, a a small company for several years, starting around 2010, called Meacham Media. Uh, we were do I was doing a lot of development work, character design work for them, but unfortunately, they they weren't able to sell anything. It's so difficult to sell ideas now. So, so I haven't done anything with them for a couple of years. Well, maybe maybe with the uh, since Netflix is throwing around money like candy and green lighting stuff to oh. beat out all the streaming services. That, that leads me to this question for you. And, you know, anybody that I've talked to, especially that has a career history like you do, you always have ideas on your own that you would love to see. Is there one project, and in, in if you could, I'm sure there's a bunch, but is there a project that you would love, that you've been working on, that you would love to see come to fruition? I'd have to look through some folders of personal ideas that I've put together. I, I'm not recalling anything in particular right now. Well, and that's a great answer because somebody, I don't want somebody taking the idea and then doing it. Well, that's them. right. So I we're we'll find a folder and then show you a few things, but then. Right. Uh, but now we, we're, we'll keep it. It, it just, it, is there, you know, as, as you develop things that, that desire to create more, um, you know, do you have something that, and you don't, don't name the project and, and don't show us anything yet because we want to keep that a secret, but something that you, you would love to produce. Um, I don't know. I, I'd have to review my stuff again. I don't know. It takes a lot. I don't know if I'd have enough energy to get back into producing and you know, on, on a daily basis. Probably a, a fair amount of work that would go into it. So as we kind of roll out and, and, and close up here, um, again, I, there's a, a great respect that I have for everything that you've accomplished, all the people that you've worked with, right? And, and in this, what I find fascinating about the, our Chuck creative side chats is Chuck has influenced so many people. And, um, and that, that has permeated into those people influencing other people, right? Uh -huh. and, and your career is a, a kind of a gold star of who, you, who you've influenced. Do you, see, do you see something as kind of a next up and coming? Like, I really enjoy this series. I'd love to see what they do with it. Something that you take enjoyment in watching the creative of like that you respect that somebody else is doing. Well, I know that when the Simpsons came out, I really loved the design on that show, especially Bart Simpson. I think he's a terrific design, great little character. And I, it's amazing how many years they've lasted. Can you, th well, we're past 30 now, I think. <laughs> yeah, they've surpassed uh, Scooby-Doo. And, and which is, boggles my mind and in, in a great way because animation taking that form and that just goes to show you that great story writing right great stories can propel anything you got to have a good story you know that's what you know chuck when he had mike maltese oh my god the writing was great the two of them yeah one of my all-time favorites from there is i mean i have a lot of all-time favorites from chuck and mike but i love robin hood daffy yoinks in a way the buck and a quarter quarter staff yeah, I remember you know. Robin Hood Daffy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Joe Barbera, I remember he hired away Mike Maltese and Warren Foster. Warren was working for Frizz. What a coup. He got two of the great cartoon writers. Uh, that would have been probably around 1959, maybe. 
So, so again, when I went to Hanna Barbera full time, I kind of reunited with Mike. He was working <laughs> at home a lot, but I'd see him there regularly. Which is which seemed to go on a lot with the uh, the poaching of great talent. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. boy, he really poached. <laughs> that was so, a great coup. Is there a is there a kind of a closing story so, something that you find that that you don't share too often? Maybe it's your time at Warner Brothers with Chuck and that crew. Maybe it's your time with with Hanna Barbera, uh, where you kind of think, I can't believe that happened. Like I've heard the Willie Ito story, and again, I'm not going to give it all away, but it has to do with a lunch and a couch, right? And I was cracking up when I heard the story, and you had some great ones too at our Chuck Jones family gathering last year. Is there one story that you can kind of think of that you're like, man, I can't believe that? Happened? Oh boy. I know it, it, you probably got a lot, but one particular that you were like, this is, and, and by the way, you're sharing this with 10,000 people on Facebook. So. Yeah. Well, Oh, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my notes right now. Oh, you got me back on screen. I do. Anyway. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's see. I'll tell you something funny when I was first there. Oh, I think the first Christmas, that would have been 1957. That was the year of Sputnik, too. Uh, well, I'll tell, I got something to tell, but I remember for Christmas, the gift that the studio gave us was a bag of Bugs Bunny carrots. <laughs> <laughs> we all kind of groaned. <laughs> they weren't very generous, but uh, it's funny. What was it? The carrots? did not put any of us into orbit like <laughs> and I was thinking and then I thought later maybe there was a bonus inside the bag of carrots I hope I didn't eat the bonus you know <laughs> and I could do probably a half hour on this but I won't my wife handed me a little note here there was a famous story about uh, there was a wonderful artist named Phil Mendez he used to come over and do freelance work for us at Hanna-Barbera and uh Later on, when I was away from the studio, he was working there on staff. He came back in to work on staff and they didn't have a room for him or a cubicle or anything. So they had a desk in a hallway for him to sit and work. And he kept asking about, do you have a room that I could share with someone or whatever? So finally what he did, this was clever and I wish I would have been there. He went to the, he moved his desk into the men's room, the bathroom. And what he did with the word men, he added D-E-Z to it. So it said Mendez. And people would walk in there and they'd see Phil sitting there drawing at his desk in the men's room. They, they found a place for him right away. And you know, <laughs> nobody took any photographs of that. And me, I used to take photographs and uh, Tony and I used to do a lot of eight millimeter filmmaking around the studio. I would have taken some photographs of that. There's no record of it. It's a shame. And, but that is a great story. Uh, have you heard of Phil Mendez? Yes, I have heard of Phil Mendez, and which yeah, makes I'd like it even to talk funnier. More about Iwo, Iwo Takamoto. What a great talent! Well, Iwo. you know what? Uh, actually, so I don't. I don't have. This isn't like a. This isn't like NBC broadcast, right? Where I have a hard break. What I want to do, but because I'd like to hear about Iwo, because I noticed in some of the interviews sure. you, you mentioned him. Before I do that and let you go um, on, let you kind of discuss Iwo. What I wanted to say too is, I believe that anybody who purchases anything um, today, Chuck Jones Catalog.com forward slash Jerry hyphen Eisenberg, you will do a dedication, and if it's not signed, you'll sign it, and then I believe there's a dedication and something that goes along with it, from what I've been told. Um, so love that. Make sure like everybody, as you're kind of thinking, um, Jerry's a legend. So as you're purchasing something from the catalog, um, he will dedicate for you now, Jerry. Um, so tell me, uh, and by the way, someone saying, Scott saying Jerry and Ben sounds like a great idea for an ice cream name. I think, I think we just <laughs> flip it and we do the Jerry and Ben ice cream. It's there's no copyright infringement. Hey, that's right. Fine. Well, right? instead of Ben and Ben and Jerry's, but, uh, no, but we'll flip it. We'll do Jerry and Ben's, and then that way we can capitalize on a whole different market. Uh, so you brought up Ewo. Could you discuss yeah. like your affinity with Ewo? When I when I started at Hanna Barbera full time, you know, after freelancing, uh, Ewo joined the studio the same week I did this, and that's where we met. 
he had come from Disney. He'd spent 16 years at the Disney studios. And uh, what a terrific artist, you know, he's pretty much self-taught. And uh, even his, he did a lot of uh, straight drawings, you know, like life drawings and beautiful work. And he was also very intellectual. That's what attracted me to him. His conversations were so interesting, like with Chuck, you know, and maybe a few others, uh, Paul Julian. Um, and uh, we both were bachelors. Well, no, he was actually, he was married, but his wife was up in Canada with their baby. I think they were like separated. We used to go out to dinner a few times a week. We used to work a lot of nights and uh, got to know each other pretty well. And then, uh, what was it? A couple of years, no, oh, three or four years later, he got, he, got, he got divorced and then he got remarried. And he left me. <laughs> I wish he was still here so he could hear that. It's yeah. a shame Ewo isn't still with us, you know. What a, what a great talent, you know, and what a great intellect. And it's some, someone I highly recommend you, uh, like oh. those who are watching, take a, like Google his name and, and take a look yeah. at what he's done. Absolutely. Also, he did, his sense of humor came out. He did tons of gag drawings of him and me and, and Willie, a lot of stuff of me. Um, I guess I used to say all kinds of silly, crazy things, and it would inspire a new gag cartoon. <laughs> I got a stack of stuff of his. And, uh, so did you keep a lot of those drawings? I did. I have everything. Oh. And when I was, luckily, when I was at Marvel, I happened to have them with me at the studio at one time. I think I was copying them. And uh, someone set fire to the building one night. But fortunately, they were down low enough in a cabinet. They survived. A lot of the edges are singed. There's a little water damage. But, uh, but his sense of humor was fantastic. It would come out in those gag joints. His sense of humor with dialogue. And uh, I would, I would, I would die, and I say that only figuratively, to see to if there's some way in in the next coming weeks, months, whatever. Is there if there was some way to maybe highlight some of those drawings? Maybe there's some scans or something that we could show on the, you know, on a Chuck Jones blog or something like that, and and do a little write up on you and Ewo and and those and Willie and those gag drawings because I would absolutely love to see those. Great. Oh, I'd be happy to show you. I can make some extra copies. I once, uh, I once made a copy of everything for Ewo on a, at one of his birthday parties. I gave them to him. And then after he passed away, they had a memorial for him at Warner Brothers in a big lobby room they had. And uh, uh, Amy Wagner, this gal that was working at the studio, she put it all together. She surprised me when I got there. She had all these copies that uh, Iwo's widow had that I'd given him. And she mounted, put a whole bunch of them up on the walls. You know, all these crazy caricatures he did of me. And <laughs> that was a nice surprise. Uh, you know what? I, yeah, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell Scott Dickin right now. I'm like, Scott, let's, we, need to make, we need to make something happen there with Jerry and those drawings and maybe a little blog post on creativity between him and Iwo. I think that would be fantastic. Um, so Jerry, Jerry, I want to, I just want to, want to be respectful of your time. Also, I want to thank you so much for what you've done and just coming on here today and, and sharing this creative side chat. Why I think this is so important is, um, the more I've gotten, I've, I've been able to meet you once in person, which was an absolute blessing last year. Oh, really? I found, oh, I'm sorry. We must have met at the Chuck Jones Gallery or something. Huh? We did. I'm a very forgettable person, so I just kind of blend in with the background. Um, but I did get to meet you at dinner. We went to that restaurant, and I don't remember where it was. We had a giant bus. Remember that? Oh, that was the, wasn't that the one where they did a, uh, there was a play, a murder mystery play with dinner? So Something, yeah, and, and I got to meet you there, and that was awesome. And to me, the more I get to know you and the fact that I've been able to meet you in person and now you talk with you about your career and history and, and the things that you love, I have a, I had a great respect for you before. I have an even greater respect for you now and everything well, that you've How done. is my table manners, you know, because Scott has never arranged another dinner like that since. Did I do something, you know? Well, we, we had to put you at the back of the room, Jerry. <laughs> oh. Come on, I'll, I'll behave. But I, 
I, like if I'll have a dinner for four or whatever, three, like when we can get back into it, I'll sit with you and whatever, and you can do whatever, you know, you do whatever you want. We'll just tell the waitress it's fine. Oh, great. <laughs> so um, again, everybody, if they want to take a look at Chuck Jones, um, catalog.com forward slash Jerry hyphen Eisenberg, you can see all of some wonderful work for there for purchase. Again, Jerry will dedicate and sign. If it's not signed and he'll also dedicate, we have the Scooby-Doo, uh, 50th anniversary piece, which Scott told me there's very few of because that thing's been like going lightning fast. So if you want to get your hands on that, and then uh, there's some other wonderful pieces in that Gicle um, that you can, that's a, if you purchase an AP, that Bob Singer Gicle goes along with it with matching numbers. Um, so Jerry, I, I sincerely hope we do this again because you're a G I'd love to. Yes, and then, and then maybe we can get into some more of those drawings and stuff and those gag things, because I would love to do this um, like this again. So thank you so much. Yeah. Any, any I parting- I can show some of the gag things on the screen here. I can hold them up. I would love that. You know, I would absolutely even, love that. Yeah, there's more stories about not only Sanrio, but Marvel Films, uh, Ruby Spears. I have, I have and, and I don't have time today, but I do have to, I do want to know about Marvel films. I do want to know about Ruby Spears because there's so much packed into that. So let's, let's bring you back for another creative side chat because one, wait, what does Scott have? Can you, can you highlight Scott for a second? What did you just show on there? What's that? You, those oh, are some, uh, shaggy. some shaggies here that uh, Jerry was doing some running around. Hold it closer. I want Bob Singer to be jealous. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. There you go. So Jerry, we, we need to do a creative side chat, Jerry Eisenberg round two. So let's make that happen. Cause I want to hear some more about that. So this is only the part one of two that we can pull off. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. You've been so grateful. Or, uh, you, gracious. I wish you good luck and good fortune and to Scott and everyone else. I'll look forward to this. Thank you. Absolutely. This year or if it's next year. No, let, I don't, why wait? We got, what do we have on our hands right now? We've got some time. So let's, let's make it happen this year and okay, do something. Next week is fine. <laughs> <laughs> right? We've got Thursday open. It's good. Well, thank you so much, sir. You have a wonderful and great evening. We look forward to seeing you again. And to everybody watching on Facebook Live, by the way, your wife, you're a gorgeous dear. I love the shirt, the tie dye. That's my betrothed there. Look. Absolutely. <laughs> we are serious. Hey, Lamar, I know mooning here. Come on, stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You're good. We I'm are serious about for a her. Second. You're good. So She's thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining. Absolutely. Thank Have you. fun. Thank, thank you guys. You Have thank a good you, audience. Night. Yes. Thank you, Facebook Live. Thank you, Zoom. And we will see you again next time. Looking forward to it. All right. Take care. Thank you. Okay, Ben. Bye bye. Well, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs>